Happy Sunday, Resolve Church. Welcome to the first week of our new and adjusted format for how we worship together as a church family. You'll notice that we've attached our liturgy uh, to this video so that whether you're with your family or by yourself or with a small group, we can still worship together in a similar and familiar routine. We anticipate that this will all be over in the near future and we're excited to be together again and we want to continue kind of in the same rhythm and routine that we are used to as a church family. Even though we're doing a different format for the sermon uh, due to these quarantine orders, uh, I believe that this is a unique opportunity for us as a church, individually and corporately, to experience our life as Christians in a different, maybe more personal way. And on a side note, I believe it's very providential that God has us working through the book of Exodus in this time of our nation's history. It's providential that we've also titled the whole sermon series, Journeying with God Together, because we truly are on a journey with God together as a church family through these unprecedented times. And I'm excited to be able to do this together. I'm excited to lead us through this time. I'm glad and thankful that we get to do this as a church family. We're going to do things a little bit different. We're going to take a look at Exodus chapters 13 and 14, but I'm not going to read the entire two chapters in one sitting. I'm going to kind of break it up uh, kind of over the next uh, few minutes. So we'll go ahead and if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Exodus chapter 13. We're also going to have it on the video here so you can follow along. I just have two points for us as we look at the leadership of God uh, in his people's life, which is how we remember and we look at the rescue. Okay, so how God institutes different rituals to remember his redemption, to remember his salvation, to remember what he had done to bring his people out of Egypt and out of slavery and fear and oppression and this great and miraculous rescue, what God does in powerful and majestic ways to display his glory and to rescue his people. We'll start by taking a look at Exodus chapter 13, verses 1 through 16. The Lord said to Moses, Consecrate to me all their firstborn. Whatever is the first to open the womb among the people of Israel, both of man and of beast, is mine. Then Moses said to the people, Remember this day in which you came out from Egypt, out of the house of slavery. For by a strong hand the Lord brought you out from this place. No leavened bread shall be eaten. Today, in the month of Abib, you are going out. And when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, which he swore to your fathers to give you, a land flowing with milk and honey, you shall keep this service in this month. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day there shall be a feast to the Lord. Unleavened bread shall be eaten for seven days. No leavened bread shall be seen with you, and no leaven shall be seen with you in all your territory. You should tell your son on that day, it is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt, and it shall be to you as a sign on your hand, and as a memorial between your eyes, that the law of the Lord may be in your mouth. For the strong hand the Lord has brought you out of Egypt. You shall therefore keep this statute at its appointed time from year to year. When the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, as he swore to you and your fathers, and shall give it to you, you shall set apart to the Lord all that first opens the womb. All the firstborn of your animals that are male shall be the Lord's. Every firstborn of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb, or if you will not redeem it, you shall break its neck. Every firstborn of man among your sons you shall redeem. And when in time to come your son asks you, what does this mean? You shall say to him, by a strong hand the Lord brought us out of Egypt from the house of slavery. For when Pharaoh stubbornly refused to let us go, the Lord killed all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of animals. Therefore I sacrifice to the Lord all the males that first opened the womb, but all the firstborn of my sons I redeem. It shall be a mark on your hand or frontlets between your eyes, for by a strong hand the Lord brought us out of Egypt. We see in these verses that there are essentially two rituals that God is instituting to help his people remember what he has done, to ground them really in who they are. The first is this Feast of Unleavened Bread, which we took last week um, in Exodus chapter 12. God institutes this as the Passover. For seven days in the first month of this new year, remember, it's the new year for them, new beginnings as God's people. For a whole week, they were to eat unleavened bread, they were to sacrifice a lamb to remember the lamb that died so that they would not die, that they would live. This purpose was to remind the people of the rescue out of slavery. It was a yearly remembrance uh, every single year. And we continue this today. Many years later, Jesus eating the Passover meal, shared with his disciples the bread and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take this and do this and eat this in remembrance of me. And he took the wine and he passed it around and said, this is like my blood, which will be spilled for you so that you might be free and clean from sin. Drink this in remembrance of me. 
every single week, we as a church, as, as Christians, we remember our salvation out of slavery to sin and to fear. Jesus was the lamb that took the punishment reserved for us. And instead, he gave us his perfect life of worship, of love, of devotion to the Father, given to us as a gift so that we are forever seen as right in the Father's eyes. He gives us his Holy Spirit, which enables us to obey God and enables us not to fall back into the previous ways of living, their former ways of life, of slavery to sin and fear. God's leadership here in instituting this this feast is one which helps the people to remember this redemption by embedding it in a very physical ritual. It proves continually instructive. I believe that God instituted the sacrament of the Lord's Supper for us as a church because we're so prone to forgetting, right? Even from week to week, we forget about God. We forget about what he's doing in our lives. We forget about how he loves us and has promised to always take care of us. I mean, even think about last Sunday to this Sunday, how dramatically different things are now in our nation's life. So different. And yet, one of the practices which helps to ground us in our identity is the time of the Lord's Supper. It's the common ritual that really binds us together and reminds us of who we are, of the salvation, the freedom that God has given to us. The second ritual is the sacrifice of thanksgiving or the sacrifice of redeeming the firstborn. We'll see that for animals, the firstborn of an animal would be killed to be reminded of how all the firstborn of Egypt died in order for the Israelites to be freed. And for humans, the firstborn of a human family would be redeemed. That means to be bought back. It was often uh, some kind of a cash donation back to God to be reminded of the debt, the price that God paid through the death of the firstborn of Egypt in order for the Israelites to be free. This is a sacrifice. It's a sacrifice for the families to give of their money back to God, for the firstborn to say thank you to God. Because remember, God keeps saying, when your sons ask you, like, what are we doing this for? You can relate them the story. Now, we no longer offer these kinds of sacrifices today, obviously, but that doesn't mean that we're not called to a life of sacrifice out of thanksgiving and love for who God is and what he's done for us. You know, we give a sacrifice of our time, of our talents, and of our treasure back to God. But I think the the verse that really sums this up best is found in Romans chapter 1, 12, verses 1 and 2. Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is a spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. The death of the lamb that the Israelites participated in and put it over the lentils and their doorposts was the foreshadowing of how Jesus, the firstborn of God's family, was sacrificed in order to make life possible for all the rest of God's children. God paid that price because we could not afford it. We are of infinite value to the Father. Why do we ever doubt that he takes care of us? But we do doubt and we forget And this is why God and his grace institutes this ritual for us to always be reminded and to live our life for him. Well, after instituting these these two different rituals, uh, now we move in the narrative of the text, starting in verse 17 of chapter 13, to the rescue. And it starts by these pillars of cloud and of fire. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them by the way by the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, lest the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. But God led the people around by the way of the wilderness toward the Red Sea. And the people of Israel went up out of the land of Egypt equipped for battle. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for Joseph had made the sons of Israel solemnly swear, saying, God will surely visit you and just carry my bones with you from here. And they moved on from Sukkoth and encamped at Etham on the edge of the wilderness. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them all along the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, that they might travel by day and by night. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night did not depart from before the people. This is obviously a miraculous phenomenon. You know, two million people seeing this cloud following them and leading them, guiding them, shading them from the blazing sun, this pillar of fire at night to warm them in the cold desert nights, but to continue to guide them so that they may hastily leave 
to freedom. I think here we see God's leadership of both comfort and guidance. It's not a stretch of the imagination to say that in the desert, the days are blazing hot and God gives the coolness of this cloud that they might travel in comfort and ease. And then at night in the desert, it gets real cold, real fast. And this fire would warm them and guide them. God demonstrates what true godly leadership is, which is both bringing comfort to the people as well as guiding them where they need to go in order to be with God. I think this also ought to remind us that God is in the business of comforting us when the scorching heat of affliction starts to burn in our lives. He brings the coolness of his presence and of calm. When the coldness of loneliness or or despair begins to creep into our hearts, his presence warms our hearts and gives us the courage to press forward, knowing that he's with us, knowing that he's with you, that we're adopted into this eternal family of families. Well, then we move into Exodus chapter 14. And here we see this final confrontation with Pharaoh and his army and the forever freedom on the other side. Then the Lord said to Moses, tell the people of Israel to turn back and encamp in front of Pi Haharoth between Migdal and the sea in front of Baal Zephon. You shall encamp facing it by the sea. For Pharaoh will save the people of Israel. They are wandering in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts, and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. And they did so. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, the mind of Pharaoh and his servants was changed toward the people. And they said, What is this we have done, that we have let Israel go from serving us? So he made ready his chariot, and took his army with him, and took six hundred chosen chariots, and all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the people of Israel, while the people of Israel were going out defiantly. The Egyptians pursued them, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and his horsemen and his army, and overtook them and camped by the sea by Pi Haharoth in front of Baal Zephon. When Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you've taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done in bringing us out of Egypt? Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians, for it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. And Moses said to the people, Fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You have only to be silent. The Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Lift up your staff and stretch your hand over the sea and divide it, that the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry ground. And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they shall go in after them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts, his chariots and his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten glory over Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. Then the angel of God who was going before the host of Israel moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them, coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel. And there was the cloud and the darkness. And it lit up the night without one coming near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night, and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. And the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, the waters being a wall to them on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went in after them into the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And in the morning watched the Lord in the pillar of fire and of cloud, looked down on the Egyptian forces, and threw the Egyptian forces into a panic, clogging their chariot wheels so that they drove heavily. And the Egyptians said, Let us flee from before Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon the chariots, and upon their horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the water returned to its normal course when the morning appeared. And as the Egyptians fled into it, the Lord threw the Egyptians into the midst of the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen. Of all the host of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea, not one of them remained. But the people of Israel walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters being a wall to them on their right and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians, so the people feared the Lord, and they believed in the Lord and his servant Moses. In this chapter, we see that God is setting up a final confrontation with Pharaoh. And he does this by having his people kind of wander around in this wilderness just to the east of Egypt so that it would look like they were lost. It would look like they were wandering and Pharaoh would kind of almost wake up from his sorrow and say, let's go get them back. They're wandering in the wilderness. Ha, we can go get them. 
So he gathers all of his chariots, all of his horsemen, all of his whole army, and sends them to go destroy the people. The people are brought intentionally by God to the sea. And what do they see happening? They see the army on one side. They see this ocean, this sea that they can't get across on the other. And they are between a rock and a hard place. And what is their, what is their feelings? What are they feeling as they see this army approaching and the impossible situation they find themselves in? Well, they're angry, right? They tell Moses, did we not tell you to leave us alone? It's better to serve the Egyptians, better to die here than die in the wilderness. We told you to leave us alone. They're scared. I mean, you have the most professional army in the world bearing down on them, literally no way out. They're scared, they're angry, they're confused, they're dismayed. They blame God. They blame Moses for bringing them into this impossible situation. I think in this time of our nation's history, some of us probably feel a little bit like the Israelites right now. Scared. We might feel angry. We might feel confused or or, or dismayed. And for some of us, this is fear of, of health, you know, maybe getting the virus. Some of us, there might be scared for what my income level is going to look like. Perhaps some of us have already lost our jobs or are going to see our income drop dramatically. We might be feel scared that we don't know how we're going to pay rent or, or the mortgage. We might even think, where's my next meal going to come from? Will I even have a job after this is all over? What's going to happen for my kids with their schooling long term? Decisions that I have to make, I don't know how to make them in light of the situation that's going on. I'm confused. And it's okay to feel these things. It's okay to feel these things. God has intentionally brought us, guided us sovereignly as a nation, as a church into this situation. Because I believe that God has in each of our lives a way that he desires for us to grow in light of this time. And he brings us exactly where we need to be so that we would see his glory and that we would be called to trust He provides always for his people, sometimes in huge and kind of miraculous ways like we see here. Oftentimes it's through smaller yet no less miraculous ways. But I think the important thing we need to remember two things is one, that God is with us. God did not abandon his people. He brought them intentionally to this. He has not abandoned them. The key verse is verse 14. The Lord will fight for you. You have only to be silent. What is the people's response? What is God calling his people to respond to this impossible situation? To trust. To trust. To be quiet and let God do the saving. Let God be the one to fight for them. God is with you. God is with us. We have only to be calm and to trust. God will bring us through this. I believe this is a unique and incredibly important time for us as a church to be the family of God together. We need to keep in touch with one another. We have so much technology that allows us to be able to do that. Let's utilize it, all of it at our disposal. Let us know how we're really doing with one another. Let's be honest about how we can help and what's, what we need. We as a church ought to seek to meet each other's needs. I believe that this is an opportunity for us to grow in, in personal and intimate ways. And many of us are quarantined in our homes, and God is literally forcing us to slow down and begin to focus on the most important things, which is our relationships to ourselves, to God, to our spouses, to our kids. We can be either like the Israelites and choose to respond in in anger, blaming God, blaming Moses, or we can trust and choose to see this as a time of our life that God is bringing intentionally for us to grow to grow in dependency and trust in him. How we choose to see this time of our city's life will greatly determine what we get out of it. You know, whether we're grumbling or complaining or being able to see ways that I've grown and see God in ways that I haven't before, ways that deepen my trust, deepen my faith. God brings them out through this miraculous way. See, the cloud and the fire move behind the, the congregation of Israel so that the Egyptians can't see the Israelites. They can't get through to them at all. God brings a wind which parts the waters, so there's an avenue for God's people to walk on. And then when the Egyptians begin to go into the dry land and pursue the Israelites, God causes all the water to crash down permanently, powerfully, majestically, 
and epically defeating the enemy of his people. The people are now on the other side of the Red Sea. This is a permanent separation from Egypt. There's no going back now. There's no looking back at Egypt and saying, gosh, I wish we were back there. Though they would say that, they can't get there. This is a permanent separation. This ought to remind us, for those of us in Christ, there's no one going back to the world. There's no going back to our old ways of living. We're permanent citizens of heaven and of the kingdom of God here and now. The sea of death has been pushed away, and I get to walk into freedom. Notice that they didn't run. They didn't flee. They walked. They walked calmly all the way to freedom. The way was made smooth and easy for them to get to the other side and experience freedom permanently. Jesus makes the way smooth and easy for us. His life was given so that I would be allowed to walk right up to God and to speak to him as a friend or a good father, as an adopted child of God. At the end of chapter 14, verse 31, what do we see? Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians, so the people feared the Lord, and they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. We see that there's two things coming out of chapter 14. One, God gets the glory, and two, his people grow in their trust and faith in him. I believe that for us as a church, he's brought us to a place where we will see God get much glory for himself. We'll see us grow. I think that God desires for us to see us grow in trust and faith in him as we see him provide. We see him protect his people in many and miraculous ways that God wants us to pass on to our children for many, many, many more generations to come. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much that you do not leave us. You do not abandon us. I thank you that you provide miraculous ways, powerful ways, beautiful ways for us to see you. Jesus, I thank you that we are reminded that you were killed, that we would not die. That Jesus, you rose again from the dead. This eternal life has been given to us by grace. Jesus, I thank you that you go ahead of us, that you comfort us by your presence, that you're guiding us, that you're leading us. Lead us and guide us as a church in this time of our nation's history. Lead us and guide us in our personal lives and our family lives. We look to you, Lord Jesus, for all things. We pray all these things in your heavenly and perfect name. Amen. All right, Resolve family. This is a time when we typically have our response uh, to God's word and to the gospel that we've unpacked out of his word. And we do this through communion or, or the Lord's Supper, just as we took a look at in Exodus chapter 13, that this is a ritual that God has instituted in our lives for us to be reminded of our identity, of being adopted into his eternal family, of his goodness in providing salvation and bringing us through out of slavery to sin and fear and oppression into his glorious freedom. So after this video, after this little time here, go ahead and take some time to pass out the elements and partake together, whether you're in a small group or you're with your family or even just by yourself. This is also a time when we give back to the Lord of our finances and we want to say thank you. It's the sacrifice of thanksgiving that we see in Exodus 13 is to say thank you. And if you've not yet set up an online profile for giving online, which is going to be the best and easiest way to continue to support the work of God through the Resolve Church in this time as a nation, just go to the Give button below. It'll be really easy. It takes one minute to set that up. This is also a time when we respond in prayer. So I'd like us to all conclude, uh, again, whether it's your family, by yourself, or even in a small group, just to pray together for a time. Thank you for joining us on this wonderful Sunday morning. I love your Resolve Church.